This is the Trading Psychology Podcast. This is VP, creator of No Nonsense Forex and author of the book No Nonsense Forex Trading Psychology. And with me, as he always is, it's the illustrious Rob Reinhold. Illustrious? I don't even know what that means. I assume that's good, but uh, I'm not totally sure. But hey, everyone, this is Rob. I'm the head trader for Maverick Trading and Maverick Currencies. And I uh, do a crazy experiment called the Flat Earth Trading Society. Go check it out on YouTube. And uh, hey, Rob. Yes, Patrick? Happy 50th episode. Can you believe it? I actually can and cannot at the same time. Like, I know we've done a lot, but when I looked at 50, I'm like, oh my gosh, 50. And then I thought to myself, when we first started out, if you told me you're still going to have ideas after 50 episodes, I would have said, you're insane. I'm out of ideas at 20. But here we are at 50, and we've got a lot left in us. We do. And on that note, too, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and you have an idea for something that we absolutely have not covered, please put it down below. We are always open to those ideas. And a handful of our shows have come from ideas from you. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, but in this episode, there's a reason why this is episode number 50. We've been saving this one. Now, this is something that a lot of people have uh, already requested, and they've already asked a lot of questions, um, including, well, you know, VP, Rob, if these are problems that plague so many traders, and it's it's the main reason traders fail, well, why don't I just automate as much as I can of my trading, and so many of these problems will just magically go away? So we are going to answer that question as best as we can today. And I think a good way to start and Rob, this is really your department because you, you pay so close attention to this where I really don't, is to kind of start from the beginning, start from the genesis of how all of this came about and the history of how we went from, you know, however we used to do things back in the 1910s to the way we do things now. Um, kind of take us through that, that journey for a moment and then we'll kind of bleed into everything else. All right, Patrick. Now I'm going to go back a couple hundred years. And then I'm going to go back about 100 years. And then I'm going to go back to when I started. And just to show you the evolution of the market. Now, if you go back to like the 1750s, uh, in New York, in lower New York, somewhere right around uh, 13th Street was Wall Street. And there was a big park there. And it became known that if you had stock certificates in companies to buy and sell, you met down at Wall Street. Now, it wasn't called Wall Street. It was called Wall Street later because it got so popular that people's livestock were moving in and out of the trading floor. So they had to put up a wall on the street to keep the animals out. Now, some people think they use it to keep the animals in, but it was set up there to keep the animals out to where people could buy and sell stock certificates throughout the years. That's how trading started. Just, just people making transactions and there wasn't even a central place to do it. Now, what they did is they built the New York Stock Exchange on that site. And now we have this very famous building where people go inside. And for hundreds of years, that's where all the stock trades in the United States took place. Now, look, you could still do private sales outside. But if you really want to be serious, you would call someone who had access to the New York Stock Exchange, a.k.a. a broker. And that broker would have someone inside that building that they could call when telephones became available and say, I need you to place this order for this client of mine. And then they would walk around and they would go to the uh, a pit of uh, JP Morgan, where all the people that were trading JP Morgan stock stood around and they would go in there and they would negotiate a price. And then they call the person back and said, yes, I bought the shares for them in their behalf. That is how the market worked for a good couple hundred years. Then in the 70s, we started to get computers and the NASDAQ was created. And the NASDAQ was the very first trading floor that wasn't an actual floor. It wasn't a floor whatsoever. I know I've got people say, but Rob, I see people at the NASDAQ on CNBC all the time. That is simply a prop. There is no NASDAQ trading floor. It doesn't exist. It's all electronic and automated. As you can see, a huge change has gone by to where now all of a sudden you don't have to have a trading floor. 
but you still had to have a broker. Remember, you still had to have a broker, call them up, and they would make the trade. Well, in the 90s, we started to get online brokerages to where you didn't even have to have an actual human being broker. You could literally put in an order on a computer. Now, look, look at just the difference of a couple hundred years and just how different it is. Today, it's really different than it was just back in the 90s with as far as automation goes. If you would have met someone from the 1700s in 1990 and told them about this electronic exchange, they would have said, oh my gosh, it's fully automated. It's out of control. Humans aren't going to be any part of this. It's over. And guess what? They were wrong. They were wrong. They've been saying this from the Industrial Revolution. Remember when uh, all the new machines were going to have it to where no one had a job anymore? I hear the same stuff today with AI. People saying, oh, we're not going to have jobs anymore. There's not going to be no traders anymore. Look, that hasn't happened yet. I don't think it's anywhere close to happening. I still think people are definitely going to be involved in this process. Now, let's take young 22-year-old Rob in 1997 and Rob was he opened up a Charles Schwab account because Charles Schwab was the first online broker available and I didn't have internet at home so I had to go down to the Charles Schwab office where they had computers and I was making some trades there and then I learned about this firm called Maverick Trading that was about two blocks away I went over there and that's really where I started my career when I started trading Listen to this. This is like the stone ages of online trading. Stop orders did not exist. Patrick, can you, could you believe trading without a stop order? You had to have what's called a mental stop. And mental stops are really hard. Can you even fathom trading without a stop order at this point? I can't. Uh, but there's a lot of people out there who do it that way. And, uh, and they all have problems. Well, you're right. And that's they all have problems because... It's really hard to get yourself to take a loss when you need to take a loss. That's really all this is about. These stop orders, when they finally got created, it was somewhere in around 1998, I was so relieved because I could follow my stop order nine out of 10 times. What I couldn't do was follow it 10 out of 10 times. So when the process was taken out of my hands, I was so relieved that I could just now have the stop and I wouldn't have to have that battle, that internal battle of, should I put it in or should I not put it in? It was already in, already taken care of. Another thing that we had to deal with was, it was called direct access trading. What I mean by direct access trading is when you take a look at the stock market, the stock market is made up of traders. So again, let's go back to the old uh, Wall Street back in the field. You, you had to find a seller. If you wanted to buy stock, you had to walk around that group of people and be like, hey, anyone selling, anyone selling? Well, in the market, there's what are called market makers. And these market makers, by law, always must be buying and always must be selling. Now, not necessarily at the price that you want, but you can buy and sell from them all the time. And they all advertise their price. So your job is to try to find the best price for your order. When I started out in trading, we had what's called a level two screen and level two screen showed you all the people that were buying on the bid. So again, you had uh, Merrill Lynch buying a thousand shares on the bid and the bid was uh, $50 and one cent. Sorry, we were in fractions back then. So $50 for Merrill Lynch. And then there was another broker there buying a hundred shares. And then the next person was buying 200 shares at 49 and three fourths. So if I had a lot of shares to sell, I couldn't sell them all at 50. I had to go down the line because that's that's where the orders were. And if I wanted to buy, I'd look over on the ask and there was someone only selling 100 shares on the ask. I want to buy 1,000 shares. I have to look down the line and realize it's not until $51 where I have someone who's selling 1,000 shares. So I have to go to that person. If I want 1,000 shares, I either have to send an order for 100 shares to the person at 50, 200 shares for the person at 50 and a quarter, 100 shares for the person at 50 and a half. You get, you get the point. I have, to, 
I have to send off individual orders to the market makers. And getting an order was very difficult, especially if there was a fast moving market. You would have to look past what was right there in the market and say, I need to grab this person that's a dollar away just to get a fill. That was crazy. What were you trading? That sounds like a really e-liquid market. It was just a liquid or was it just really inefficient? It was the NASDAQ in 1997. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's just what it was. Remember, we were trading in fractions. So so there wasn't another bid for, a, for another quarter point sometimes. So imagine that. Imagine if right now you're looking at trading and there was a stock at 50. And you know, if you wanted to buy it, you may not get 50, but you know, you'll get $50 in one cent, or maybe there's a little slippage and you get the next person at 5002 or 5003. Imagine that your bid is $50, 50 and a quarter, 50 and a half, 50 and three quarters, 51. Those are your increments. And if other people get to those people first, you get down the line. It, it was really tough. So, so placing an order was a total skill in itself. You had to pick where you were going to go. And if you didn't get to that person first, you had to redo your order and go find another person. I actually do remember this from penny stocks because that is a thing because it is such an illiquid market and the bid and the ask spreads are so crazy, um, especially when you get really into those trip zero, quad zero stocks. Um, but ever since then, I've been very spoiled because... The Forex market is so liquid, we're really regardless of what pairs you're trading, that you can always get filled for as much as you want. So that's uh, that's pretty wild. I didn't even, you know, as big as the NASDAQ is now, we can't even fathom it being so small to where you couldn't even get filled at the price you wanted to. You had to get filled at a much worse price for over half your order. That's bonkers. It was absolutely bonkers, but it was just the way you did it back then. Now, just think about that. That's still way better than the way they did it 100 years ago. The, the progress was amazing. Somewhere around 1998, 99, a company called Archipelago, they were out of Chicago. They were a, a part of Townsend Analytics. They created the first smart order routing system to where you could literally hit buy on Arca. You had a little button that says buy Arca. And ARCA would go out and try to find the best bid in the ask. So it was called a smart order routing system where you basically just said, I want to buy it. And ARCA did the legwork where it approached the best bid or offer first and then went to the next, went to the next, to the next until you got filled. That was a game changer. Now, again, this is all automation. This is all automating things. And there were huge changes to that. So just with the addition of stop orders and smart routing, the world of trading dramatically changed. So how did that affect traders on the actual floor? Well, that is a great question. The first time I went to the floor was in 1999. I went to the Chicago Board of Options Exchange and I went to the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And it was busy, it was really busy. And when I started meeting and talking to traders, they told me, oh, this is nothing. There's less than half of the people here that used to be here. It dramatically changed the whole way everything worked. And I got to say that floor traders, you know, when I grew up floor traders, they were the people that I looked up to like, oh my gosh, that's, that's a trader. The irony of that is, um, in the early two thousands, or sorry, like in the mid to late two thousands, we had many people approach Maverick that were former floor traders that had gotten out of the business in the mid nineties. And they wanted to get into the business a decade later. And at first I thought, oh, I bet these people are amazing. They're, they were floor traders. They were the people that I held on a pedestal. They were terrible. Why? Because they didn't understand the changes in the market. And they had left the market for too long. And when they got back, they literally didn't know how to route orders. They, they didn't know how to do anything. And it really surprised me. But the one thing it did, it really ingrained in my mind that you always have to be innovating and automation is just here. It's always going to happen and you just have to be innovating all the time. So I guess that can lead us into, I guess, the meat and potatoes of the original question. And for clarity, though, please understand that when we talk about automation, it's not binary. You're not, you're not either discretionary or you automate. I'm a discretionary trader. But there are certainly parts of my trading that are automated. 
I think for context, it's just to keep it simple. That this is this is not super accurate, but just to keep it simple, when we talk about discretionary traders, we talk about people who actually press the enter and exit button, so to speak. To where in automated trading, you would not do that. You would have a program do that for you, for the most part. Um, but there's there's this whole middle ground, and we'll touch on that a little bit more in the episode. But moving forward, for the people who think that it is absolutely best to put together an EA trading robot that just does everything for you, and you can walk away and just let it do what it needs to do, keep all the bad trading psychology off the table, and just trade an actual system, which is exactly what we're trying to do here. Seems like that would be the best route to go, no? Well, you really just got to the heart of the question here. You got to the heart of the question. Um, the first thing we need to do is quantify what, what does automation even mean? Because as I just walked you through, if you talked to anyone from the past, they would consider what we do automation. I, I have met people who literally had to draw their own charts because there was no such thing as charting software. Can you imagine if they were looking at this market today, thinking of how automated everything is? Now to us, pulling up a chart online is like, what, what are you talking about? It's like my kids having the internet is all they've ever known. There is a lot of automation that is just, you're already doing it, you just have never thought about it. And until you get older, and you can go through the progression just like I have, yeah, you're, there's just gonna be a lot of things that have changed. But I really like what you did there, and you drew the line. Drew the line of what is automation, what is not. Is a person clicking the button for the entry and the exit? I think that is a, a clear definition that we have to draw because other than that, it's this episode isn't going to be any value because I'm gonna argue against everything you're gonna say because I already see automation here. So let's stick with that as the baseline of automation, discretionary versus automated. Let's talk about fully automated systems. There are fully automated systems out there. We're gonna talk about some of them. I'm gonna tell you about a guy who has been doing this since the 70s. He is considered the greatest trader of our generation. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He's fully automated, but guess what? He's still in control. His team is still in control. They are still running the system. This is the gauntlet I want to throw down. If you believe that there is a way that you can work for a little bit of time, develop a black box trading system, and then hit play and never look at it again, that is the biggest lie that you've ever been told. Now look, I'm gonna step on some toes here. I always try to stay fairly politically correct, but sometimes I don't give a shit. I see these EAs for sale and I just shake my head. And I said, look, they might be good right now, but can you imagine if I say, hey, I've got this EA that I developed in 1998. Do you wanna buy it today? You would laugh at me. You would absolutely laugh at me. But isn't that the same thing that they're selling you? Is that, hey, if you buy this today, you never have to check it. And in 23 years, it's going to be just as good as it was today. The idea of that seems laughable, absolutely laughable. But people are buying these EAs with the concept that, oh, this is just going to do all my trading for the rest of my life. So I want to just get that out there. This holy grail of, of either buying an EA or building an EA that is durable and makes changes along with the markets and you never have to check it is the biggest lie of trading. Well, let's go a little bit deeper into that. Um, so I don't really think realistically people are, people would ever buy an EA under the pretense that they could use it all the way up until the year 2040, you know, just, just make me a lot of money for the first three years and then I'll figure it out after that because I'll have money and I can spend it on something else if I want to. Oh wait, is, is that the shelf life? Is that is it three years? Do they tell you it's three years? Do they tell you when you buy the EA when it actually is no good anymore? Well, I don't think they do that, but I also don't think they tell you that it's gonna be good for 20 years. I've never seen that as a sales pitch. Well, they never talk. They never talk about when it's no longer good. Well, they don't, but okay. Let, let's just say I don't, I don't need it for forever. I just need it for right now. It's based on technology that I would imagine 
has been created recently. But I just, what I'm trying to get at is I think there are inherent problems with a system that does everything for you start to finish. And I was hoping to maybe touch on those a little more because there are, there are some really, there's some big holes in this theory that it's just better to automate everything um, because it takes care of all the training psychology things that we spend so much time talking about on this show. It's, yeah, I agree with you, Rob. It's not a panacea. Um, but I, I was hoping to get a little, a few more reasons why. I, I just want, I just want it for the next two or three years. It seems way better than me actually doing things on my own. I'm also lazy. You know, why can't I just do this? It seems so much better. So what, what are the holes in that logic? Well, the holes in the logic is you fully admitted that it is not durable. It is not going to last. You don't know exactly when that's going to be. And so what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to discretionary decision your automated trading. Like that sounds like a terrible idea. Like, uh, I think it's going to be good for a, maybe a year and two months. It, it, the problem is, I mean, do you see how all of a sudden you're taking this, oh, I've got this system that's systematic. And now you fully admit that it's not going to work for the whole time you, you own it. And you have to now make a decision, a discretionary decision on when it's no longer good. And then you have to now build a set of rules to determine how do I know that this is not any good anymore? How do I know this is not just a drawdown in the system or how do I know when the system is out of date? All of a sudden now you're having to apply a system to determine how, when your automation doesn't work, as you can see, it's just, it's a silly, silly idea of you fully knowing that at one point it's going to fail, not knowing when that is, and then making a discretionary decision. It's just the dumbest, silliest thing I can think of. Well, I wouldn't say that's my ethos as far as all this goes. I would say that, look, you know, it's probably based on, you know, either price action or indicators, uh, which is, it's just pattern recognition that repeats itself. And if I, if I can put a good money management component into it, that's good enough. That's, that's going to last a while because at the end of the day, it's just math and pattern recognition, which has been around forever. So why can't I just do that? Okay, great question. Do you think that the stock market is as volatile today as it was three years ago? I don't know. You tell me, is it? It seems like it's not because people are just kind of waiting for it to fall. So I mean, I know the VIX is down a lot, but I, I can't remember what it was years ago. Okay. And the system that was built around that time, it was built around those levels of volatility. Um, those are not the same levels of volatility today. Now, look, you could say, well, I built in something into the system to control for volatility. Great. There are a thousand changes happening in the marketplace all the time. And again, if you take a snapshot, it's like, it's like taking a snapshot of, of you and your friends in 2017 thinking, uh, this is, we're never going to change. It's going to change. It's going to change all the time. And if you just take a snapshot and you keep dressing like you did in 2017, listening to the same music that you listened to in 2017, doing the same things in 2017, when you get to 2030, you are so out of touch and out of date. That's the same way it works with these black boxes. They have to be maintained. Yeah, the, the two main arguments against black boxes that I can think of is, um, one, news events, the, the scheduled ones, and then the unscheduled ones, too. I've heard people say that there are EA components out there that can actually pay attention to news events the exact way I told people to pay attention to them in my course which I thought was really cool, really innovative. Um, but at the same time, those the significance of those news events change. We've seen that a lot over time. The Fed has a lot more pull now than they did before. And this has all changed. And people are like, hey, VP, can you come out with a new video that's you know updated? I'm like, I, I really can't because as soon as I do, it's going to change again. You know, You guys have to be responsible for staying on top of that. So there's that, and then there's news events that completely come out of left field, and a trading robot is not going to be able to account for those things. Um, and so then you're going to have to jump in at some point. Uh, that is one, and then my other one, and you know I, I want to get your opinion on both of these, Rob, is 
if it malfunctions for some reason, which sounds a, a bit absurd, but I've actually had emails from people say that they used to trade with EAs until it just stopped trading the way it was supposed to and it either shut down completely or it started putting in trades where it wasn't supposed to. And you just have no control over that because you didn't code it. Um, you don't know the person who did. And now you're stuck with whatever results it gave you. Um, could be a little bit bad. Could be really, really, really bad. You don't know. I want to touch on your first point, And I want to use the Bank of Japan as just a great example. For years, we meet every single week and we talk about the week. And for years, I told all of our traders, you can sleep through the Bank of Japan meeting. You can sleep through it. You can sleep through it. I told people for over a decade, you could sleep through the Bank of Japan because nothing ever happened. There was a brief little moment in like 2017, I think, where they did something. And then we had to watch for like another six months. All of a sudden, the Bank of Japan meetings are the biggest meetings out there. They're way bigger than the Fed meetings. How do you program that into an EA that was made in 2018? Like you just can't do it. The markets are so dynamic and always changing that that an, an automated program written in the past can never, it will never be durable. It will never, ever, ever be durable. And then I've never even heard of an EA going rogue. I mean, that is terrifying. A rogue EA that just starts doing something different. Oh my goodness. Uh, that even terrifies me even more. Yeah, and I, I think going rogue is... Um... Uh, a bit fantastical, but I, it's just like anything else. Anything you use that has code written into it gets updated a lot. I'm not a very techie person, so I'm not the best person to speak on this. But if you're running a program that never updates, um, sometimes things go sideways and it needs to update or whatever the case is. So it is plausible. When I first heard that, I'm like, did it really just all of a sudden develop a mind of its own and start trading? But I can understand if you know, there was just a number here that it wasn't recognizing. A very little thing can disrupt a program greatly. I do know that. So um, I'm not sure how plausible or how often you're going to see something like that. But if, even if it's a little bit possible, I don't want to have my entire trading fund hooked up to something like that. You know, call me old fashioned in that regard. But you know, that that's just those are the two big the two big issues that I've always had. And I know that they can be overcome with better, smarter technology over time, but then other problems can develop. So it's just, and I know we have automated traders listening to this that are probably jumping up and down saying, no, it's, it's, not, it's not like that, VP. It's not like that, Rob. It's, it's way different. The, I understand both sides. And that's why I, just, that's why I took the other side in this, um, in this back and forth you and I had, Rob. Even though I am mostly a discretionary trader, and I prefer it that way, but then again, I also backtest by hand. Like I couldn't easily embrace technology. I'm just I'm just a creature of habit that way. So, being as experienced as you and I are, and being the age you and I are, maybe we're not the best people to speak for automation. But I actually think you might be an excellent person to speak for this, not because of your own experience, but because of what you have actually seen in front of you. You have a sample size that. Pretty much nobody else in the world, save maybe a handful of people, probably have. So let me pose this question to you. If we're using the definition we used before of discretionary and automated traders, in your firm, you know, which you actually have to be good to work at a firm. So these are all skilled traders. Many have many of them have put years in, many of them made a lot of money. What percentage would you say are discretionary? compared to automated because Maverick does allow automated traders into their firm. So that being said, what is the the ratio of discretionary to automated? That is a great question. And it's funny because in this argument that I've been having, you haven't been having an argument. I have, and I've been getting a little heated and, and, uh, I'm just the antagonist, which is super fun by the way. Yeah. I realize. look, I'm, I'm not against automated trading. I, I'm not against it at all. I'm actually very for it. But I just, I just cannot stand this idea that you write a code once and you walk away. Um, it's just, it's just so irresponsible to me. So let me ask you, let me answer your question. Um, we have two divisions of Maverick. We have Maverick Currencies, which is a forex and crypto trading division. So all directional trading, all just, uh, you know, you're trading your symbol. And then we've got Maverick Trading, 
which is stocks, options, uh, index options, and, and stuff like that. So I have to draw a distinction between the two because automated trading does work better for directional trading like Forex and crypto. So I'm going to have to say probably somewhere around the 50 to 65% of our uh, Forex and crypto traders are using automation in their entries and exits. Absolutely. For Maverick trading, because we are so heavily based in options, options trading could be very difficult um, to automate especially when you're navigating, you know, some of the options that you're looking to buy or sell have no volume and they have no open interest. And to, to try to navigate a good price using a computer program can definitely be difficult. It could be done, but it, it's definitely more difficult. So I would say probably more around 30% at Maverick Trading. So it's mostly Forex and crypto traders here, uh, along with some metals and indices traders as well. So that's really interesting. It, it's You said 50-50, probably shaded a little more to the automation side. That's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, automated trading can actually work really well in this type of arena. Um, but if you want to be a discretionary trader, you can also do every bit as well. Uh, it's not like you know, you're trading subpar by not automating most of your system. Uh, can I draw that conclusion? Absolutely. Look, there's nothing wrong with automation. I, I'm a big fan of automation. And I think what you said earlier is that automation does solve a lot of these psychological problems that we've been spending 50 episodes to try to prepare people to overcome. Automation is a really good answer for a lot of people. Yeah, and that's kind of the solution I wanted to present as well. Um, maybe not going full automation, but maybe experiment with portions of it, in particular on the exit side, if that's possible. Um, because I think you were telling me off air, Rob, that that number actually goes up when you're just, if we were to redefine the term and talk about traders who only or primarily use automation, not for entries, but for exits, you said that number goes up quite a bit, doesn't it? Substantially. And I mean, we're talking about something like a, a stop order. And that's an automated order. Um, yes, you put it in, but you could have code written that will put it in at the place you would have put it in. Um, a trailing stop is automated. Uh, we, we tie stops all the time to times. Hey, I want to get out at this time, not at this price, but at this time. I mean, you can, you can automate a lot of your trading system. And I think the exit is the best place to do it for sure. Yeah. And so I think this is something actually a lot of people already do. Even my old fashioned ass does, you know, some of this. So you know, again, there's, there's levels to this. And um, I know if, if, if we really want to paint it in black and white, like we did earlier, just for the sake of simplicity, I know from the friends of mine who have worked at private banks, hedge funds, places like that. Um, I haven't talked about this with all of them, but the, 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 two I've talked to about when it, can't, when it comes to uh, high frequency quant trading and things like that. They say that there are departments for that within a lot of these firms, pretty much with every one of these firms now they have a department, but it doesn't make up the majority of their trading. Um, the majority of their trading, even on a technical analysis level, is done with actual human brain components focusing on at least the entry, if not the exit. So. Pure discretionary traders just know you're in good hands. Automated traders know you're in good hands too. At the highest levels of trading, at least in the United States that we know of, um, a lot of both goes on. And let me jump in here and just tell you about really the, the greatest automated trader of our time. He is super secretive. Uh, jump online. You, there's now stuff that's starting to be done about him. His name is James Simons. He runs the Quantitative Medallion Hedge Fund. He was one of the very first people into automated trading back in the 70s. And let me tell you about James Simon's Medallion Hedge Fund. He has been averaging after fees, after the fees, somewhere around 65% a year for the past 40 to 50 years. And what happened was in somewhere around the mid 2000s, he shut it down for outside investors and he only just trades his own money now and some of his close friends and, and relatives. He has a team. It is fully automated. It's a fully automated system, fully automated. But 
guess who he has running the automation? He has engineers, he has mathematicians, and what they're doing is they are in that system every single second of the day making some changes here and there. Hey, we got some new data in. We need to make a little change here. So you can see even at this highest level, this fully automated medallion hedge fund, it's still somewhat discretionary. And that's really the point I want to make in this whole episode. I am not anti-automation. I'm very pro-automation. But I just, I cannot stand the, again, I, I'm probably stepping on some toes here. I cannot stand the lie of, I'm going to program this once, walk away, and it's going to be the best thing in the world. That's, that's a lie. It's a total lie. You can be fully automated, but you've got to be fully in control in the driver's seat. And just like these guys at the, at the Medallion Hedge Fund are doing, always looking and making sure, is the system running correctly? Is it doing what it should? Has the market changed? Have my inputs changed? Do I need to make a change to it? If so, let me go test that out. As you can see, that's still very discretionary. There's still somebody in the driver's seat driving that program. So yes, automated trading can be great, but closing your eyes and walking away, I think you're just asking for a disaster. And I do know for people that want a little bit of help on this and may want to look to automated solutions in terms of their exits, uh, there are programs out there. There has to be, because I remember pff, 10 years ago, this guy out of, out of Utah, kind of close to where you are, uh, Rob, came out with this uh, something called the magic line. It was really just a trend line. And every time it would cross over the trend line, price would cross over the trend line one way or the other, it would enter or exit a trade. So th this technology has been around for a long time. If that was around 10 years ago, I'm sure there's plenty of things out there that can take your exit indicator or whatever you use and automate that process for you. But just know, like we said, automation in any of its forms is not a panacea. It can do you wrong or it can just shut down altogether. Please be aware of that. Only trade money you can afford to lose. Uh, Rob, do you have any uh, other solutions before we wrap it up here? I don't really have any solutions, but I do have a book recommendation. For anyone who is interested in automated trading, for anyone who is interested in the history of it, or want to learn about the guy who has been the absolute most successful person doing it, there's a book called The Man Who Solved the Stock Market. Uh, the book came out about five or six years ago. It is about James Simon and it is about his hedge fund. And it's basically the history of James Simons and his hedge fund. It is a fascinating read. Again, if any of you are interested in automation and automating your trading, I highly recommend you to read this book. Look, it's not gonna tell you anything about coding. It's gonna tell you the evolution of it. And it's gonna tell you times where it failed and what they did to fix it. It's, it's really fascinating story. And like I said, he's very secretive. Not know many, many people know about them, but if you're interested in automation, you have to read that book, in my opinion. But thank you, traders, for listening to our take on automation. I'm sure there are many takes, and feel free to put some down below. If you're watching this on YouTube, or if you'd like to go over to YouTube and sound off a little bit, all thoughts are welcome. Um, but once again, thank you all for staying with us for 50 episodes. I think it's actually been 51, because we did an intro episode, if you count that. Um, but it's been great, Rob. Here's to 50 more. 50 more. That, I don't know if we have that many ideas, but we'll give it a shot. But thank you so much, Patrick, for having me on and starting this project with me. I have had so much fun. I, I've, it's just been fun. And every time after we, we film this, uh, we chat afterwards. And I always tell you, man, I'm having, I'm having a blast. I'm having so much fun. Um, so let's just keep going as long as we can. I agree. And yes, he does do that after every episode. Um, uh, but the, the important part is that it's impactful to you. And we've definitely seen the impact of that so far. So uh, whether we get to 100 or not, we're going to try as hard as we can. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the Trading Psychology Podcast. We will most definitely see you next week. Goodbye, everyone.